bring you up to date to kind of where we are. Yeah, we're in this uh, series here, uh, midway through, called What About?, um, where we've been uh, taking a look at a couple of different questions and um, issues that we feel, uh, based on some research, are important to um, people who really aren't necessarily plugged into a faith community. Uh, this, this goes back to Barna, George Barna. He's got an organization that does a lot of research on trends that are happening within faith communities. And this whole series has been based primarily on a trend as to why millennials, it goes much further than millennials, but why millennials um, aren't really involved in faith communities anymore. And they, they gave five specific reasons. And uh, what we're doing is we're trying to address each of those topics. And, and we're not trying to answer them. We're not trying to say like, you know, um, that we have the, the end all be all for you. We're just simply trying to give each um, uh, issue attention so that we can begin to dialogue and, and, and hopefully, uh, based on a relationship that you have with somebody that invited you or maybe our online community, I hear there's a lot of people now uh, watching online, so hello online. Um, we, we'd love for this to be the beginning of the conversation and then, and then you pursue this with somebody um, of faith who, who you trust and who you have a relationship with. And so um, just appreciate you guys joining with us. If you're new here, man, I want you to know that you are welcome. And um, we, we count it a privilege that we would be able to get to share moments uh, together like this. And so, yeah, thanks. Let's just uh, hop in for today. Because today we're talking about doubt. Doubt. Um, we've covered a couple of different topics. We've done sex and culture, um, science, things like that. And so today we're going to talk about a topic that um, I, I would have to say, if we're honest, is familiar to all of us, and it's the topic of doubt. Now, doubt comes in many different forms and shapes, okay? And, and so we're going to be taking a look at kind of how, what is it that um, is God's response to doubt? And the first place I want to start is um, potentially it's been your experience with the church that um, the church and doubt haven't done well together. I mean, at least that's what the, the studies of this research says. It's, there's an outline for you guys to follow. It's at the very top of your outline. If you look there, it's on the back of your bulletin. And um, basically, the studies say that there's a percentage, a large percentage of people out there who are basically saying, man, the church is not a safe place for my doubts. It's just not a safe place for me to have legitimate doubt. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's like, it's not welcome. Or if I do bring my doubt, it's handled in a very elementary way where I'm just sort of told to read these verses and I'll be fine in the morning. You know, like, just kind of like sleep it off. You know, you'll grow out of it. And uh, we don't want to do that. I think we could do better. That was the word that I felt like the Lord was kind of giving me to start off is I, I feel like we can, um, I feel like we can do better. Uh, better than some of our, our responses have been. And, you know, some of our responses sometimes have been like, well, if somebody has a doubt, um, it's, it, it's in the Bible, so you should believe it. Like, it, it's in there, so why are you doubting it? And, and, and when I'm saying this word better, uh, I'm not meaning that these things aren't true. I'm just thinking that maybe we could do a little bit better in engaging people uh, in their doubt and, and maybe even in your own doubt. Um, uh, what about this one? Um, well, you just, you just have to believe. It's just like a leap of faith. So you, you just have to kind of think that, um, you know, it'll, it'll work out if you, just, if you just keep believing, you know, kinda, you kind of have Journey in the background in, encouraging you in their 80s uh, stint. Um, or maybe, maybe you, you um, have, have been a person who has received uh, what we sometimes call here affectionately like um, uh, a scripture grenade. Yeah, I don't know if you know what a scripture grenade is, but like where you get around somebody and you actually share your doubt with that particular person and they know enough scripture, they're like armed with enough scripture to not, to not really necessarily enter into your doubt, listen to you and love you well, but they know, oh, I know what, I know what this one is. You need a Romans 8, 28, sucker. And they pull it out and they're like, I know exactly what you need. And as a matter of fact, I'm not gonna get close because there's gonna be shrapnel. So boom, boom, you better? And like, maybe, maybe that's been like your experience. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe you've done that. You know, like I can't say that I'm not um, clean from having participated in some of these things, but you know, sometimes we can say things like, and this might be something we say more to ourselves, but like, don't we know better by now? Like, 
really? Still at the same spot? Um, I think sometimes the, the overriding message is just like, shh. Doubt? Eh. Makes us look bad. You know, we got to have our show together. So let's just maybe keep that on the DL. I think we can do better. So today, it's going to be kind of like an invitation, and there's going to be a bit of a dare. Um, I don't know if you're into that or not. I know when I grew up, playing truth or dare, it never ended good, okay? <laughs> never took me to a good spot. Um, but hopefully, today, as we kind of maybe dare you to go to a place that you've never been before, especially with your doubt, um, maybe the Lord will bring something new that he's never brought before. I'm going to pray to that, and then we'll hop into some scripture. Father, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would um, teach us, Lord, but even more than that, Father, I pray that through your spirit you would meet us and we would be able to experience you like, like um, our heart would get to mingle with your heart and you would do something beautiful through that. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, yeah, like, so let's just hop in. Theology of doubt. Um, how, and so basically the theology of doubt is this is like a study of God and doubt and how does, how does God respond? And again, remember, like, this is never comprehensive. When I say theology of something, this is just to kind of get the conversation going. A little bit of a survey here. But what I figured we would do is we would go through some of the famous doubters in Scripture. Um, if you don't know Scripture, that's awesome. I'm glad you're here. And if, the, if the, all these people are new to you, then, then you're like, awesome, honored guest, like learn with us a little bit. If, if you know scripture some, then there's probably some people like hopping into your mind right now. So on the count of three, if, if I need you to yell out a name from scripture of somebody who would be like uh, considered a famous doubter, and we'll just kind of see where we end up. One, two, three. Thomas. You guys are so mean to Thomas. <laughs> I mean, the poor Tommy, dude, like he's got one bad moment. You guys just crush him. Said we could do better, right? Thomas. All right, so let's go ahead and start with Thomas. He's just an easy one, right? So what you're going to see here is you're going to see some scripture, um, and, and you're going to see, uh, well, okay, so if, if your eyesight's not incredibly awesome, you might not see it, but trust me on it, um, but, but you're going to see here a, a couple of different responses that people had to a situation, and then you're going to see how Jesus responded to it, and then we're going to make some observations, okay? So Thomas, um, the situation from John 20, uh, 25, uh, basically, he, here he is, and, and Jesus um, has been crucified, and people are talking, they're talking a ton of smack about Jesus, and they're saying even that he's been resurrected. They're talking about Jesus like he, he's alive again. So think about somebody that you have, you've been to their funeral, you've seen them die, You've, you've seen them be buried, that you love them, you begin the grieving process, and then all of a sudden it's like, grandpa is alive. Like, what? What are you talking about? I mean, I don't know how your response would be, but that was the word on the street, and there was a lot to that resurrection, which we're going to see in just a second, but, but here's Thomas's response. He's like, unless I see it, I'm out. Unless I can take he goes, he goes even one further because I, it doesn't say that he was angry, but it seems like maybe there's some anger and some hurt there. But he's like, unless I can like take my hand and put it in his side, unless I can touch the wounds, I'm out. Get that stuff away from me. There's some pretty serious doubt in this particular situation. And we see that Jesus comes in the room and he first speaks to everyone, and he's like, peace to everyone, and then he goes directly to Thomas. And he's like, Thomas, here it is, man. You can, you can touch. Go ahead and touch, and, and we can end this doubt. We can end this moment. Pretty cool how Jesus goes directly to him in his moment of doubt. What about Mary? Now, this isn't Jesus' mother. This is one of Jesus' friends, and um, she had a sister named Martha, and basically they had a, a brother named Lazarus, and, and they were all friends, and, you know, they, they had like a, like, let's say, first century small group, you know? Like, they would eat together, and they'd hang out, something. Well, Lazarus died, and Jesus knew that he was dying, but he didn't go there immediately. And so, um, uh, and then he dies. It's like Jesus waits for him to die. It's this crazy story, right? It's like people are not understanding why Jesus didn't do something when he had the power to do it. 
it's like people were wondering why didn't Jesus do something when he actually had the power to do it. I mean, that might be you here today too. And if it is, you're in good company because here's Mary. She's an all-star. You, have, you gotta understand, like, like um, if you're looking at, I don't wanna compare Mary and Thomas, but I think I'm gonna right now. <laughs> so if you're looking at Mary and Thomas, Thomas is known for this moment back here where you all yell out his name. Mary is known as this like extravagant worshiper of Jesus who sits at his feet and she gets celebrated. But let's check her out here in this moment. She comes to, to Jesus as he starts walking toward her and she's like, if you had been here, man, if you had been here, if you had shown up the way that I know you can, my brother would still be alive. Jesus doesn't say anything. He doesn't invite her to touch the wounds. He doesn't teach her about the kingdom. You know what it says he did? Two things. It said that he was deeply moved in his spirit. It was like he was sad with her. And the next scene, we see that he's weeping. So Jesus doesn't go and redirect her doubt. He doesn't go and, and rebuke her. He's actually with her and broken as she is. Well, then we know Peter. Some of you may have yelled out Peter because Peter and Thomas always lose when it comes to like bad examples. And so Peter is a guy that, you know, um, he did a lot of, he did some good, he did some bad and all these sort of things. And one of the things um, that he was known for, and, and I'm not sure actually he's, he's super known for this, but like, because we all know how he denied Jesus. But the, you know, there was a moment when Peter walked on water. Like, it's one of those things where you do a ton of things right and you do a couple things bad, you, you focus on the bad things. But the, listen, the dude walked on water. Like, he didn't barefoot like my buddy Rob Sweeten. He actually walked on the water for a while. I don't care, I didn't say how many steps, but I know that it was way more than any steps I've taken on the water, okay? So he's walked on the water, and he's, in, in this scene, he's walking on the water, right? And then he's got some doubt, he's got some stuff that's happening, waves, he loses focus on Jesus as the story goes, and waves start to come in, he starts focusing on all this stuff, and um, he starts freaking out, okay? But listen, let's not forget, he's on the water, right? But he starts freaking out, and um, there's this moment of, you know, doubts and fear, and he's like, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. As he starts to drown, he's like, Lord, save me, and he reaches out his hand, and Jesus reaches out his hand and takes hold of him and says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? It doesn't seem to be an overwhelming rebuke like Jesus is old school football coach, hand in the, in the like, grill, twisting his neck. I mean, he reaches out and grabs him by the hand while they're both on the water. And basically he's like, man, you could have more. There's more of this. Final scene here is Adam and Eve. Um, it, so this takes you to the garden in, in Genesis 3, 4, and 5. And again, just to encourage you, you have these in your outline. Go and read the full chapter of John 20, John 11, Matthew 14, and then Genesis 3, 4, and 5. And, and um, man, in that, you're going to see uh, when Adam and Eve looked at each other and said, he's not as good as we thought. Actually, you're not going to find that in the scripture. That's, that's not a scripture. It's just what their hearts were saying to one another. Because here's what God had told them. He's like, man, you can enjoy all of these good gifts in the garden, but most of all, you can enjoy me. Just don't go there. Just, just um, show me that you want a relationship back with me. Trust me. Allow me to be your treasure. And, and don't go to this one space. And so if you're familiar with the story in Genesis, there's temptation that comes in, right? Now, temptation is not sin. We're all tempted in many ways, as was Jesus. And so temptation comes in, and there hasn't been any lines crossed. The temptation is basically to, to start to think that God's holding out on them and that they can actually find their life outside of what God has promised. And then this is where the doubt comes in. He's not as good as we thought. Let's look over here. And that's how sin entered the world. He is not as good as we thought. 
I mean, if you were to trace back this morning or this week, and any time you felt as though you were outside of the will of God, any time you felt like you were acting out of selfishness or greed or, or lust, your heart probably said the same thing. You're not as good as I thought, so I'm going to go here for a minute. Well, what does God do? He moves towards them. He moves towards them, he finds them, he asks them, where are you, what have you done? He engages in a dialogue with them. He doesn't leave them alone. Interesting, as I was kind of like working through this, um, just this thought came to me that was really clear in all these scenes is that God moves. Interesting, um, I know that faith is is the, the sustenance that activates things, right? You remember how Jesus would say, like, that because of their lack of faith, there wasn't a lot of stuff that happens. And we know if you read further in the, in the New Testament, people get saved by faith, right? So Ephesians doesn't talk about now it is by doubt that you are saved. Like, it's not, it's not, we're not going to, we're not, we're, I'm not holding up doubt as though we're uh, a replacement of faith. Um, so, so faith, don't, don't miss me, faith activates stuff in the economy of God. Let me, just, let me just say, you can't know God, you can't be forgiven by God, you can't be made right, you can't have like, meaning and joy in your life from God's perspective, at least, without faith. It's impossible to please God, and if you're not pleasing God, then you're not enjoying him the way he meant to be enjoyed. And if that's not true of you, then you're missing out. And so the Christian faith says, I, believe, I have faith that I'm not enough, that I'm broken inside, that I have sin that started when I was Sophie and I just increased it until Jesus at some point got a hold of me. I have faith that in myself I'm not enough. And, and the Christian has, has said something like, I'm done with me. I'm turning from this life. And I have faith that there's a God who loves me just as I am and sent his son Jesus to a cross. The Christian faith says on that cross, my sin, my brokenness that should separate me from a holy and righteous God was was poured out on Jesus. Like the punishment that that I, I should receive, I'm believing somehow mysteriously was placed on Jesus and he was crushed in my place. So that so that God maintains his justice and his love at the same time. Christian faith also says that that same person named Jesus who took on my sin also beat it by coming back from the dead and now offers somebody like me, not, not, they don't, they, Jesus doesn't want me to start going to church more, start reading my Bible more, start praying more. That's not, those, those aren't bad things. That's just not what Jesus wants initially. What Jesus wants is simply for us to have faith that, that we can't and he has already done it, so now let's let him. And that's what it means to turn from your sin and self and receive Jesus as your Savior and your Lord and the beginning of your new life, your treasure. So faith activates things in our life. When, we, when, a, when a person um, does that, they're, they're forgiven of their sin, past, present, and future. They're giving meaning and purpose because they're adopted into the family of God. They're made new. Their shame no longer, even though it may have, have a voice in their life, their shame no longer owns them. Like, faith activates all of that. So don't get me wrong when I'm about to tell you that God moves in doubt. That's not the opposite of faith. Faith activates things, but don't miss this. God moves in doubt. And as a matter of fact, oftentimes moves directly toward your doubt. I mean, we see that in all of the examples um, that I gave to you. Specifically, God not only moves in doubt, but he moves toward more. He moves toward more. It's not his intention to leave you in doubt. It's his, it's his intention to give you more through your doubt. Um, maybe you're familiar with the song Reckless Love. Uh, I will spare you because I'm a man of mercy from singing it. But we sing it often at this church. And it's about how there's this God out there who loves us and continues to pursue us and lights up every shadow and breaks down doors to get to us. I want to let you know if you brought doubt in here this morning, if you've got some hardcore, like even grieving doubt, I believe that God in his love for you is recklessly pursuing you 
even this morning. In the movie um, Chronicles of Narnia, there's a question asked about Aslan, who represents the father. Um, And the question goes something like that, uh, something like this. Is, Is he safe? Is he safe? And the answer comes back something like this. No, he's not safe, but he's good. The God that I'm talking about this morning, especially as it pertains to your doubt, is not safe. He won't leave you where he found you, but he's good. What's the, maybe the, the response to doubt, if you will? Uh, imitation, imitation. Um, if you have your Bibles, you might wanna open to, to Mark chapter nine. You're not gonna see this verse up here, but this is another chapter that I would recommend you guys reading. Um, so we're, 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 we're looking at, okay, so, so what is it that I do if I have this doubt and I'm, and I'm understanding that God doesn't want to leave me in it, that God wants to come and, and win me through it. Uh, he wants to give me something more. Uh, he wants to actually give me that faith that uh, I just explained to you that will activate a relationship with him. What would, what would be my response while I was you know, just kind of like meditating on this this morning and thinking about it through, throughout the week. And this is a story of um, a dad who, who can't get his son healed, but Jesus is in the room. And, and so there's a little bit of back and forth. And, and check this out. In verse 22, it says this. Um, his son's got this like demon in him and is like doing crazy stuff to him. And it's, it's destroying him. Um, and, then, and then the father says to Jesus, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Verse 23, and Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Man, I believe. Help my unbelief. I love that prayer. It is my favorite prayer in all the scripture. I pray it frequently. I do, I do, I do believe. Help my own belief. I'm convinced, as is Jeff Vanderstelt, who writes much about this in gospel fluency and things like that, that we are all unbelievers, myself included, that we all suffer from unbelief. Um, Jesus says that, that um, our sin is, is connected to unbelief. So wherever you find yourself in sin patterns or wherever you find yourself um, it, just kind of uh, not experiencing God the way that um, he's intended uh, you to, it's, it's linked back to an area um, of unbelief. Uh, Tim Chester, an author, writes about the four Gs. God is good and great, glorious and gracious. And he's like, usually you're not believing one of those G's, which is why now you're filled with anxiety or you're always angry or you can't take your eyes off that woman. It's usually because you're having an, it's not a behavioral issue, it's actually a belief issue. And, and, and the idea here is that um, we're all unbelievers. We all struggle and suffer from doubt. But if we use the model that's found in Mark 9, we begin to see what it looks like to invite Jesus into our doubt. It's like, I believe that you're better than fill in the blank, my pornography, or my underpaying my employees or my gossip, or the way that I'm never home, or the way that I don't love lost people the way you've called me to, or the way that I just don't care about the widow and orphan. Like, fill it, fill it in, fill it in. Like, I've got some unbelief here, Lord. Would you help my unbelief? Because Jesus is way better than the church has been as it comes to doubt. Jesus would never say, shh. He wants to be invited in. He's famous for being invited into your brokenness and your unbelief and doubt and giving you more of himself. He loves it. He's not ashamed of you when you're in the situation of saying, God, I kind of sort of want to believe this. I just can't manufacture it. Jesus is like, you're my guy. You're my kind of girl. Let's do business. Just let me get in there. Let me get after you. 
I'm like, get it. I'm going to give you more. But you got to let me in. You can't keep lying to the people around you that everything's cool. Because remember now, this guy, he, he did this in the presence of community. You know, it wasn't just like he and Jesus. It was like there was, there was community around when he's like, man, I believe. Help my unbelief. I was thinking about my unbelief this week and thinking where it shows up. Um, a couple places that it shows up. It shows up, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big uh, prover. Like, I feel really good after I've worked hard. And then when I've worked hard, I feel like I deserve things. And um, that, doesn't, that doesn't, like, uh, work out when you, when you function under a grace economy. When you function under the world, it works out. You can, like, build your career, make more money, become more and more independent. But like Jerry Heblitzel, our, our family life pastor, says, he's like, when you're raising kids, you want them to be independent. When you're raising, like, your faith quotient, you want to become more dependent on Jesus. And, and so I've got this thing where I believe that God is, he's down with me, we're cool, because he has to be through Jesus, but I'm not sure he always likes me. And I think he delights in me when I give a really, like, awesome message. And when I kill it at home. But when I fail at those things, or I'm not really present with one of you in a conversation, because I've got that anxiety old wheel going, and I escape, but I'm really there, I feel like God is super, like, I don't know, I just doubt. I just doubt that he's, like, still pleased with me. I doubt that he still has affection for me as, as his son, at least to some degree. You know, like I, I, have, this, I have this constant thing that, that I have to battle, this constant doubt that says God is gracious, so through Christ, I don't need to keep proving myself to him. And it owns me, man, it owns me, it enslaves me at times. And um, so here's my prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe I don't have to keep proving myself. I believe because you've proved yourself, I can rest and like let you do work in me and let you bring beauty in me. But, but like I don't have to keep winning your affection, Father. But I, I, so I believe that, but will you help my unbelief? We've been noticing the same thing at home. There's this generosity principle in the Bible that says like he who sows generously will also reap generously and they'll be able to do um, all the good works that God has in store for them abundantly. But here's what my wife and I have been experiencing lately. I think we've been experiencing like a scarcity mindset. I'm going to speak for myself. Because like, um, you know, so, so some of you might know our story. Our family got bigger. Um, we adopted two kids. And we're, we're just like super tired all the time, it seems like. And kind of cranky. I don't know. Like, remember, remember, babe, when we weren't as cranky? And like, and then, but then, you know, now we have this three-year-old who's like, when he's done with stuff, he throws it. All, like, I don't know why. He'll brush his teeth. He'll finish. And if I forget to tell him, he'll be like, boom. And I, I, for some reason, that just bothers me. So, I mean, it's. I know he's working on his arm, and that's cool because I'm a big baseball guy. But, but it's like, why do you, why do you throw things when you're just like randomly? He'll have a pencil and he'll just be like, boom. And I, I, now, I think, I think there's something actually cool about it. Like, if I finished this sermon, I'd be like, that's what's up. I'll see y'all later. Like, it would probably feel good. So he's probably just expressing what I want to do. But <laughs> it bothers me. And so, like, it's almost like it seems like we're in a, like a, a fight with our, with our kids all the time. Not, not the older ones. They, you know, they stay away. They're quiet. They're, they're surviving over there. What about the younger ones? We're like... Are you liking life right now? Are we the worst parents in the world? Did we somehow get it right here and we're just too old and we forgot how to do this? When's your bedtime? Like, like, that, like that is, I don't want, listen, man. So here's the deal. I came to this realization that what, what's, I, I have not been looking to God to fill, my, fill me up. And so I've been running on this scarcity thing and, and like thinking, well, you know, I'm just pouring myself out. And so I've just been complaining. I've been short. And I realized this weekend, uh, last weekend it was, that I haven't been looking 
to Jesus to abundantly fill me up the way that he promises to. He's like, I mean, if you give of yourself generously, I will give you more and you'll be able to continue abundantly blessing others. And so I've done half of it, but I think I've really doubted looking to him to be the source that will continue to fill me up. I just get so focused on what I'm giving away and what a martyr I've been and how I don't have my life like I used to anymore and I don't have my wife like I used to anymore and we don't have the conveniences like we used to anymore. And man, that is so enjoyable to suck down. but it just leaves you empty. And it doubts that Jesus is enough to fill you up with what he's promised to give you. So Lord, I believe you can do it. Man, you just, you have to help my unbelief. And I'm looking to you to do that. So as we know, Jesus changes everything, right? That's what we've been saying in this series. That's what we've been talking about over and over and over again. Um, Jesus changes everything. And so if that's true, man, we gotta get current. We gotta get current with some of our doubts. I mean, you, you may have come in here today and, and you, may, you, know, you may have brought the doubt of like, um, well, if God is good, then how can he allow? That's a legit doubt, especially if it goes beyond um, like theory and it, showed up in your life. It's legit. Um, you might have brought the doubt in here about like this is something like this. Well, what about all the people? Fill in the blank. Mm, you might bring the doubt that Mary has. Like, where were you? Where were you when I was four years old? And fill in the blank. Where were you when I was 10 years old? And fill in the blank. Where were you in my parents' marriage? Where were you in my addiction? Where were you? Where were you? Where were you? It's legit. It's valued. We love you for that. You're welcome here. Hear the voice of Jesus saying, I want to know more about that. I want to know more. Well, you might be the person in here who's brought the doubt of like, man, like really, I would call it really. Really? With the whole Adam and Eve thing? Really? Noah? Come on. Like you make me look like an idiot with my friends if, if I'm like going to align myself with you guys. And the boat and the animals. Really, with Jonah, the whole thing, like the fish and the what, and really with Abraham and his son, and really with all the violence in the Old Testament, and really with the whole walking on water thing and the feeding 5,000, like, like really with the whole like resurrection thing. Man, Jesus would love to be invited into that. He would love to be invited into that dialogue. The problem is you're either having a monologue or you're talking to people who are just going to affirm what you want to believe. So that's the dare, man. Invite him in. Like, I dare you to invite Jesus into your specific doubt and to get honest with him about when you were abused as a three-year-old or when your dad left when you were a six-year-old or when this or when that or fill in the blank, man. Like, at least allow Jesus the opportunity to start to speak into some of that stuff. And I would say do it in a safe, God-honoring community that can help you process that. Because I am convinced that Jesus changes everything. If you really look at those doubts, if you really look at, at, at the, the things that you're longing for, those redemptive longings in your doubts, what you're looking for, what you're looking for is some, some meaning and significance. Like make life make sense if I'm going to give it to you, God. And Jesus is famous for bringing significance and meaning to life. It's what he does. Your response is to simply invite him in. As we think about kind of Jesus and is, is he credible? Is he trustworthy enough for me to invite into those really tender and significant spaces? I would say only if. Only if. If, one thing, this is a one issue situation right now. Only if the grave is empty 
and he's really alive today. If he's not, then blow it off. What I'm saying, debunk it, don't come back, just throw it out. Get yourself around a healthier group. But if Jesus is alive, and even if you're not sure, but you certainly can't prove that he's still in that grave, then you probably better keep seeking and keep learning and keep inviting him in. Because the place I want to close is a very dear place to me, and I want to show you a picture. Did we get that picture at the very end? Yeah. Okay. I do my best to talk right through this. So um, this is one of the ways that our family uh, grew uh, this past year. And her name is Cora Joy. So the thing you don't know about Cora Joy is she was in foster care and all these sort of things. But there's a unique part of her story because we didn't plan for Cora Joy. We signed up and got licensed and trained for one foster child, her brother. And he's enough, yo. If you know him, he's enough. <laughs> he's the one I was, you know, I mean, her too. <laughs> so we get this call, right? And it's like, hey, um, you know, there's another and they'd really like to keep them together. And it was like in that moment, we had the power and the authority to either invite her in or say, no, it's already enough. My wife and I prayed for a little bit. It was like a pretty quick prayer time and processing time. And we're like, yeah, of course. Of course she can be invited in. And I can remember when she came to the door I don't know what it was. I mean, she, she's like, like one of my delights in life is seeing her. I've got three others, Cole, Caroline, and Cade. But she's the surprise. And when I came to the door, she didn't look all cute with her hair all like, what, it's cool. <laughs> she looked like newborn infant, like, whoa. <laughs> okay, we can do this. But I don't know what happened. This, I'm like, not necessarily this guy. Like, God just connected my heart to hers at first sight. And my life changed and has been changing more and more and more because of the life that she has brought. I want to encourage you as we close. If you invite Jesus in, if you open that door to that tender spot in your heart and you invite him to come and listen and dialogue and begin to bring you more than you're comfortable with right now, he'll do the same thing. He'll bring life. He'll bring core joy. He'll bring more than you can handle. And it'll be beautiful. It'll be so beautiful. I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come, and they're going to be up front here, and I'm going to give a benediction, and we'll, we'll officially dismiss here in, in just a moment, but, but the music will be on, and um, there's going to be people up here who are, like, they know what it is to listen and to help Jesus connect with where, where you might need to let him in, and um, trust them. You don't know them, but, but, but trust them and, and let them... Let them hear a, a bit of where Jesus needs to come in and, and allow them maybe to initially pray that into being and, and, then, and then you can follow up with that this week. And If you want to explore something that you're working through and struggling with, let us know at the church. We'd be happy to walk alongside with you. Let's pray. Jesus, I, I just believe that, that you want to do something special in this moment. I don't always think that, but today I think that you want to do something special. And um, I don't know how it works all the time, Jesus, but, but I know that when you get invited in, you, you reorient things. You turn things upside down. You touch things that we could never touch. You, you, you close loops that have been open for years. You heal and... Jesus, it says that you're close to the brokenhearted. But that you also 
you have a heart for the hard-hearted. And so, Jesus, I pray that right now, whoever that might be, we would be able to just be here in this moment and play a few choruses of this song and just ask that you would bring them to a place where they can come and be prayed for. And Jesus, in this moment, if, if, you're not, if there, people aren't coming forward, I pray that they would be praying for other people who, who need to come and experience your touch. And I pray, Jesus, that it would be safe and that um, people would quit saying no who've said no for a long time. So would you do that? Christ, amen. Now, if you'd stand, I'll give you God's promise, and uh, the moment will be open to do as you feel like the Lord is leading. Now, may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and may he meet you exactly where you are. Amen and amen. Love you guys.